Hello and welcome. So nice to have you all. We're really excited you could join us. We have some great panelists we're looking forward to hearing from today. Um, so I'm just going to start us out um, by saying welcome to the Careers Outside Academia webinar series. Um, and if we want to move to the next slide, we'll just do a bit of introductions here, um, sort of overview of the event, and then we'll have introductions from each of the panelists. Um, and that will take about the first half hour or so. And then we will move into sort of a large Q&A session with all of the panelists, um, where a moderator will um, answer questions that we actually got from you all. Thank you for submitting your questions when you registered for the event. Uh, we were able to take those and create some general questions for that session. Um, about six we had to narrow down to, we had a lot. Um, and they'll, they'll spend a few minutes on each question. And then we'll move into breakout sessions. Um, each panelist will have their own breakout room and there'll be a moderator in there to help um, assist the panelist in facilitating questions to answer. Um, and so you all will be able to then go into each of the breakout spaces. You can move around and ask different questions of different people and that will last for about 30 minutes and then we will come back into this larger space just to sort of say thank you so first we're just going to do a bit of introductions um, about the event so um, everything here today is being recorded we will be putting this up online afterwards for people who couldn't join us today. Um, there is closed captioning happening here in Zoom. There's also a live stream and there's closed captioning happening there too. So it's the automated, so not the best, um, but, but definitely better than nothing for closed captioning. Um, you all will be muted and your videos will be turned off during the event. We have a lot of people in the room. So just to try to make things a little bit smoother, um, we're gonna keep everyone's video and audio off. Um, please save your questions for the breakouts because that's the space we have for you to be able to ask your own questions. Um, but do feel free to share your thoughts in the chat as we go along. If you have any tech issues, you can um, send them to um, Raymond at the tech at ESWN. Um, that's she's named renamed herself so you can easily find her in the chat list. Um, and then we also ask that everybody abides by ESWN's code of conduct. Um, and we will put that up on the screen next. Um, so I'm not going to go through every single bullet point here, but um, I think we will be putting this text into the chat so that it's up for everyone. But we just ask everyone to consider, you know, the things they can do to make this respectful and inclusive, um, making sure that um, people feel welcomed into the space, um, making sure that you try to keep your questions concise and on topic, being constructive, um, you know, and um, making sure that you're trying to value everyone's perspectives, being mindful of um, biases and trying to avoid any comments that may be taken um, as harassment or bullying. So please keep all that in mind. And again, uh, we will put this text into the chat um, as well so that you have it for reference and I can work on that. Um, And then um, just to let you know a little bit about the Earth Science Women's Network. So that's the group that's hosting this event. Um, and it's a nonprofit organization that is um, de dedicated to increasing diversity across the geosciences with an emphasis on creating and supporting a nurturing community, working for cultural change to eliminate barriers to a diverse scientific workforce and empowering scientists through professional development. We have um, some great ways you can get involved with ESWN. If you're not a member, um, please try to check out their website, ESWN. Um, I think we have it on a slide somewhere <laughs> and I, off the top, top of my head, not remembering it, but you can check that out. There's Facebook groups and other ways you can get involved. Um, and so this event is being put on by the Professional Development Committee. It's part of ESWN and we decided to host this because we know there's a lot of interest from folks in science um, and who come through the academic ranks 
kids that want to maybe move out of that. And there are so many opportunities to do so outside of academia. Um, and so today we're really highlighting um, industry, national labs, science communication work, and government. And if you want to move to the next slide. Just to let you know, uh, the folks who are organizing this event today, myself, I'm Katie Boyd. I work at um, one of NOAA's cooperative, cooperative institutes at the University of Colorado called Ceres. I work in their education outreach group. We also have Alana, um, who is at CSU as a research scientist, and Raymet, um, who is um, currently adventuring in the world of UK research councils, which I really liked, um, and is also a member of the ESW and PD committee, but um, as well uh, the events co-chair for member events. So we're happy to have this event and uh, happy to have you all here. And uh, next, we will just move on to um, our panelists and let them introduce themselves. We have um, slides that will take you through each panelist. Um, so um, I can help if you need to know who's next, but just based on the slide that comes up, you should be able to just jump on in and start introducing yourself. And first we have um, Dr. Christine Chen. If you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes, to introduce yourself, please. Awesome. Okay, I'm hoping that my microphone and video is working. Uh, is that a they are, thumbs up? Yes. Okay, thanks so much, Katie. Awesome. All right. Uh, and yeah, thanks, Katie, um, and the rest of the organizers for putting this together. Uh, this is so exciting. Um, and yeah, hello, for everybody tuning in. Uh, I hope you are all uh, doing all right today. Uh, right, so as the slide says, uh, my name is Christine and I'm currently a postdoc in nuclear forensics at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, uh, which is in Northern California. Um, before I do my intro, I would like to take just one moment to acknowledge that Lawrence Livermore, uh, where I'm currently affiliated, uh, sits on the ancestral home and unceded land of the Pelnan and Ohlone Tribalette, who held the large freshwater marsh that was in Western Livermore Valley and uh, most of Pleasanton. This land was stolen by Spanish, Mexican, and then American profiteers through acts of servitude, genocide, and deceit. And the land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone people and other familial descendants in Livermore and the San Francisco Bay region. Uh, yeah, so um, the organizers asked me to take a few minutes just to briefly say who I am, where I'm from, uh, and how I got to where I am right now. Um, and I think out of all the panelists, I am the most recently uh, out of academia, um, although, because I just started uh, here at this position eight months ago. Although to be fair, I'm not entirely sure if that's a permanent tra transition out of academia, um, but anyhow, uh, so it's hard to know where to begin. So I could start from uh, the very beginning. Uh, I was born in uh, New Jersey after my parents immigrated here from China uh, for a, to start a, a better life and to uh, improve their education. Uh, as is common with many immigrant families, doing well in school was highly emphasized um, and both of my parents and myself definitely bought into the American dream of picking yourself up from your bootstraps and in the belief uh, in the power of education to be the great equalizer. And so I loved school. I loved learning everything. Every subject in school was my favorite. Um, and that same love of learning translated into undergrad where uh, I magically found a home in the geosciences department. It was the only department with free field trips. And that was super enticing to me as somebody who hadn't done much traveling up until then, the opportunity to go see other places. And my first freshman year class uh, was in geology. And soon enough, I started working as an assistant in the lab of the professor who taught that class. And then um, I was actually invited to be a field assistant for their graduate students field season in Southern Australia. And then it was all over after that. Uh, I fell in love with geological field work, looking and interpreting rocks. And I also discovered uh, during my time in undergrad that I love teaching. 
And having also gotten a taste of what research in geology was like, I sought out programs in geology for grad school. Uh, and I landed at MIT and got to do some amazing projects applying uh, uranium series geochemistry to ancient lake carbonates. And that allowed me to go see some incredible places like the high altitude Central Andes, uh, places like the Western US. Um, and little did I know that uh, the super esoteric subject matter that I became an expert in uh, was actually applicable outside of academia. Uh, during the height of the pandemic last year, uh, like a lot of people, uh, I went through some deep introspection about, I don't know, life in general. I had just started a postdoc at Caltech um, and I was growing uh, deeply worried about the state of the world and feeling a little like uh, what I was researching wasn't really uh, moving the dial in terms of improving society or helping people. Um, I was growing a little, uh, yeah, I don't know, just feeling a bit uh, worried and sad about a lot of things as you know one does during a global pandemic, right? <laughs> Uh, and combined with my growing disillusionment with academia, I decided that I needed to experience what doing science was like outside of the halls of higher education, uh, despite having grown up uh, all my life feeling like school was where I ought to be. Uh, and so this February, uh, I started a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore doing something more applied and something that I didn't imagine I'd be doing two, more, uh, you know, two years ago. Uh, and so, you know, I've only been here for eight months, but it's been a very eye-opening experience. And I hope to talk to you more about all that later. So yes, uh, that's my intro. Thank you so much, Christine. Next we'll have Hazel, um, Dr. Hazel Gibson. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. I also want to say thank you to all the organizers for all the great work you've done in setting us up and getting us started. It's really great to be able to speak with so many people about the other alternative pathways that you have available to you after doing your first or second or third uh, qualification in geoscience. Um, so I am currently the head of communications at the European Geosciences Union, EGU, which is in Munich in Germany. Um, uh, many of you may know us if you've ever attended one of our annual assemblies, which happens in spring of every year. And we're like the European counterpart to the AGU, the American Geophysical Union. Um, so to give you like a quick overview of my career history, I grew up in uh, Devon in the southwest of the UK, um, and I was very fortunate to grow up down there. It's a beautiful part of the world and has fabulous geology just kind of on the doorstep for anyone that uh, wants to kind of walk outside and just have a little look at it. Um, I did my first degree in physical geography and geology, which later became known as earth sciences, which would have been helpful if it had been called that before. I think more people would have understood my degree, but um, yes, so that was my first degree. And when I finished my undergraduate degree, uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I also had done pretty badly in my last uh, qualification and my dissertation that I had to write. And that really frustrated me really a lot. I felt that I'd um, uh, not done myself justice. So I decided to put off uh, going into the world of work and did, did a master's um, in um, geohazards assessment uh, at, at Portsmouth University in the UK, um, which was really great. Opened my eyes up to what more self-directed uh, research can be like and, and when you're able to actually um, really do more discovery work than maybe you're able to at undergraduate level. Um, following that though I decided to move into um, industry and so I worked as a geotechnical engineering geologist um, for just over a year and a bit in uh, Australia for a company called Coffee uh, which was fantastic. I'd never worked overseas before, and it was a real um, uh, jump in the deep end experience. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it. And it was really a love of travel that took me there. Like Christine mentions, like geology, you get all the great field trips. And when you start working, you just get to go on even more um, and get paid to do it, which is fantastic. Um, however, I did decide that uh, engineering geology wasn't maybe the field for me. Um, it was quite an intense field at the time, and it was quite a lot of um, 
hours and difficult work environment. And so I decided to then move to the United States um, where I worked for as a park ranger for uh, a season at Mount St. Helens in, uh, West, in Washington state, which was amazing. If anyone ever gets the opportunity to go and do that, definitely should, it's fantastic. Um, but because as you may have guessed, I'm not American, I uh, didn't get to stay. Um, so my visa was only for a limited period of time and I had to go back to the UK. Um, when I got back to the UK, I realized that I didn't want to go back into engineering geology, that my passion was really with um, working in science communication, working with public audiences of various different types, um, and talking about all of the different and wonderful, exciting ways that people can engage with and learn about our amazing planet. Um, and so I decided to pivot my career into working in science communication full time. And I started working at the Natural History Museum in London, where I spent a period of time working as a science educator, working primarily with school aged children um, and those visitors to the museum that were looking for educational content. And then later on, I worked as the identifications officer for Earth Sciences, which if you don't know, if you have a museum near you, you can send them the weird things that you find and they will try and help you figure out what it is. Um, and so that was my job for a while there as well. But whilst I was working at the museum, I really started to question a lot of the ways that people were thinking and talking about geoscience in particular, and not just people who, um, were, were had no experience with geology as they thought or um, said that they'd had no advanced science training even, even people from other science fields seem to not make the same connections as people who are trained as geosciences did um, so I decided to go back into academia so I kind of took a, a, a round turn back into academia and I did a PhD in geosciences communication and cognition which is basically studying how people think and talk about geoscience um, I I uh, finished that PhD a few years ago, um, was lucky enough to get a postdoc following it to study how people think and talk about geothermal power in Cornwall. Um, but following the postdoc, I think I realized that whilst academia is incredibly stimulating and a fascinating world to be a part of, it wasn't quite the, the life that I was looking for. And so I decided to move again out of academia. I've been in and out a few times. Um, but move again out of academia and this time into my current position here at the uh, European Geosciences Union, where my job is mostly to coordinate uh, all kinds of communications with our members primarily, but also public audiences, the media and anyone else who's interested in what uh, geoscientists based in Europe are up to, which is also brilliant because I get to see all the wonderful science and research that is happening across the continent and then across the world, um, which I just love. And I love sharing it with people in whatever format I can. So I'm really excited to speak with you all. If anyone has any questions, um, either now or later, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, all of my contact information is very available online and I'm happy to make it available to you as well. But thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you so much. Next we'll have Dr. Arsina Hakobian. Can you introduce yourself? And um, you know, just let you know, we only have um, less than 10 minutes for sort of our introduction. So we'll just try to kind of keep things moving along. Thanks everyone. Got it, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Arsina Hakobian. Um, right now I'm working in Chevron at their um, technical company. So Chevron is um, very basically built up of smaller companies that are under the umbrella of Chevron Corporation. And my job as an air specialist is to find and offer solutions for monitoring emissions from oil and gas activity and mitigating them. So my career path, well, I got my PhD from Georgia Tech. Um, even before that, I was born in Tehran, Iran, um, and I moved to US as a teenager. Um, went to UNLV for my bachelor's degree because my aunt lived in Las Vegas and it's not as fun as it sounds when you live in Las Vegas. And so after that, um, my PhD from Georgia Tech. Um, and then I went to Colorado State University where I was there for nine years. Started as a postdoc um, and became a research scientist. Um, I had a lot of fun. I loved my group. I loved my job. And then someone was recruiting for students and they just shared that there's a job 
for someone as an air specialist in Chevron um, in mid-career. And so I applied thinking, no way will I get this job, but let's try. And so um, as it turned out, there was an opportunity and I had a um, real long thought process and discussions with colleagues in deciding whether to leave academia. Some of the questions I asked were some of the questions you're asking, will I be able to come back? Am I too late to start um, acquiring new skills? Will I be successful if I go to Chevron? All of those questions. So um, some of them were answered during my transition and some weren't. And I've been working in Chevron for about two years and a few months now. And I've learned a lot and I look forward to having a discussion with you and sharing what I've learned. Um, I also wanted to echo Hazel's thanks to you for your participation and to organizers for their hard work. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, next we'll have um, Ms. Tabo Tabogo Mosito. Can you introduce yourself for a few minutes? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I don't know where to start. Uh, I feel like, yeah, I'm in the wrong space because you all, you know, have all these nice careers, professions and all that. But yeah, my name is Teboho and I'm from Johannesburg in South Africa. I grew up in a rural village called, in Rustenburg area in the Northwest province of South Africa. And yeah, for me, I qualified as a human resource management and I worked for corporate human resource until I decided to venture into full-time entrepreneurship. So I'm a very ambitious person and I realized that, you know, being an HR, I can't sit in the office. I enjoy traveling, meeting a lot of people and working in challenging environment. So I don't even know how I got from HR to engineering and mining. I currently own my company for since 20, since 2014, I started my own company in the engineering space. We do quite a lot of, you know, heavy industrial things, which many women are not supposed to do. So it's, it's quite challenging. My, my industry is male dominated. We are currently manufacturing underground rolling stock for the mining industry. And I personally have completed a lot of several entrepreneurship courses. I went for, you know, the Gibbs Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Program. I completed the Vital Voices Women's Fellowship. I went to Atlanta, Georgia Tech. I did the Global Women Entrepreneurship Fellowship. So I can say I have completed several entrepreneurship programs and I'm a very passionate, you know, female entrepreneur. I would like to see more women venturing into these engineering spaces. And I am available to engage and share with you some of my experiences as a female entrepreneur. And the, the most lucrative parts of, you know, being in this type of business and also how I can learn from you because I would really like to, you know, maybe continue and further my studies. But with my job, it's very difficult with work-life balance. So I can learn one or two things from, from the panel. Thank you so much. And by the way, I'm a mother of four. And yeah, I'm a hard worker. I'm focused and I'm very determined. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much. And I'll just mention, you definitely fit into this panel quite well. Um, next, thank we'll have you. Dr. Rosie Oaks. Can you take a couple minutes to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rosie Oaks. Thanks for having me along today. Um, I'm currently a senior scientist at the Met Office in the UK, specifically working on international climate services, which is all focused on talking to people around the world about how they're impacted by climate change and making sure that they have the right information that they need to tackle those problems and plan for the future. Um, my background is kind of a traditional academic background. I did my undergraduate in uh, Edinburgh, at Edinburgh University in Scotland in geology and physical geography, the same as Hazel actually, good start. And then I went to the University of Toronto to do mm. my master's and then I went to Penn State University to do my PhD. So quite a lot of traveling around. Um, and I was primarily focused on kind of ancient oceans. And then for my PhD that shifted into kind of modern ocean acidification work, looking at plankton and CT scanning them for hours and 
looking at tiny pieces of plankton for a long time. And I did really enjoy that research and was lucky enough to be able to carry that on for a postdoc in Philadelphia at the Natural History Museum there. So more work looking at plankton and I think because I was doing more modern, I'd shifted from kind of ancient stuff to modern stuff. There were more opportunities for science communication, especially being based at a museum. And I had more opportunities to talk to the public about my research. And I realized that they didn't really care about the nuances of the plankton research I was doing. People genuinely had questions about like, well, what is climate change and, and what can I do in Philadelphia to make things better? And I think the other thing working at a museum, I kind of always thought, it, I would be a professor and I was applying for jobs and just getting rejected a lot or being told, oh, you have to go and live in rural America and work at a small school. And I was like, I, I don't, I'm not sure I'd be very happy there. I don't think it'd be a good fit for me as a human. Like I, I, trying to balance that like career aspirations and life. Um, and I, I do think I could have done the job and that made it really hard to be rejected so much from all these professors. But I think the thing that I learned being at the museum was I am a scientist who loves science, but I also love talking to people. And that is kind of my unique selling point, which when it's about you, you don't really think about it. So I started looking for a job where I could link climate change and people who needed to know about climate change. So I looked at corporate banking. I looked at um, like NGOs, but I ended up at the Met Office. Um, I actually didn't even know this was a career option. And I think the reason that I'm here today is that when I started looking for a job outside academia, I felt so alone. I felt really isolated. And I'd worked so hard during my PhD and my postdoc to network. I'd gone to AGU and done all the networking events and GSA and everything at university. And I have been left totally unprepared for life outside academia. And I don't want that to happen to anyone else. So like others have said, I am 100% here for you. I don't want you to feel that isolated way. There's so many great things you can do outside academia. The world needs you and needs people who have geoscience background and that way of thinking. And hopefully today we can help you get on the right track and feel a bit more confident about the skills you have to offer to the rest of the world. So thanks for having me and looking forward to some discussions. Thank you so much. Um, Alana, do you wanna help us uh, take us into the Q&A session? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, panelists, for those great introductions. Um, we're going to start our general Q&A session now. Um, we have about 30 minutes for this, and so we have prepared six questions that we found as common themes from your registration. Um, and we just wanted to remind everyone that there will be an opportunity to ask more questions during the breakouts, um, where we'll have separate rooms with every panelist in them. Um, but for now, let's get started on question number one. So we, our first sort of theme question was about career paths. Um, and so we were curious, what opportunities are available for geoscientists with an undergraduate, a master's or a doctoral degree? And what careers or fields do you see the most demand or growth in right now? And we actually have asked, um, we would like all of our panelists to take about one to two minutes to answer this question for us. We think that this is a great question for everyone because everyone comes from a different background and has a different degree and is in a different area of study of the geosciences. So I think we should start with, I'm going to randomly pick here, Arsina, why don't you give us a, a you want to start? start us off. Thank you so much. Um, so, so that's a tough question to start with. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Alana. Um, here is, here is what, what I learned even today from the panelists' um, introductions and what I've learned throughout my career and throughout seeing the careers of others. Expect the unexpected. There's a lot of opportunities you're not even aware of. Um, and what you can do is um, saying like you can find your passion of, and what you're good in and then start to develop that into a career and it can take you anywhere you want to go. That's easy to say, but I remember when I was looking 
for jobs um, after I graduated or throughout my career and you're applying to 50, 60 jobs and you have a job of applying to jobs and you're getting all these rejections and you're thinking there's nothing out there for me, what's wrong with me? So to acknowledging that, looking back at everything that had happened, I think what I would think about is if you are interested in a job and you have similar-ish skills, apply. And so some of the op other opportunities, like specific opportunities that are available, I would say right now in my space where I'm looking at air and waste um, and emissions into water or soil, um, there's a lot of opportunities coming up in terms of climate change. So um, you want to have a set, you have a set of skills that you've developed as a scientist, but you can apl apply them to solve problems. And so how do you um, solve a problem for climate change for a small community that is losing its um, agricultural opportunity? So I think those type of things, like thinking outside the box right now, the career or the job that you're looking for may not be what you think is traditionally available. And I, I think the long-winded way of saying, step out of what's traditionally available. And in my space, I would say um, climate change and anything involved with that, even if sometimes you're working with, for example, Department of Defense is hiring people to mitigate climate change for their bases internationally. So that's an opportunity that can be for geoscientists. I know everyone has skill sets that would be applicable to, to that. So I'd say there's a lot of opportunities. Think outside the box and don't be worried about applying to things. You can mesh your skill set to what you're applying to. Thank you so Sorry. much for sharing that with us. Um, sorry that I surprised you with that. And uh, as we loop back around all the panelists, if you think of something more, we can, uh, you can answer um, some more at the end of everybody's answers. Um, if you have more thoughts about question one. Um, next, we'll hear from Christine. Christine, would you like to tell us what you think about question number one? Yeah, it sounds perfect. And I, I agree with Arsena completely about, uh, yeah, ex going out of your comfort zone and also not knowing at all what is even available outside of academia. Um, I think other folks also uh, in their intro said that um, it felt incredibly lonely and um, I identify with that as well. Um, I wanna give a very specific answer to um, the question about what opportunities are available. Um, I was surprised to learn at Lawrence Livermore that there are, um, I, had this, I had this impression in my head that, uh, oh, everyone in a national lab needs a PhD. And that is not true. There are actually some really awesome uh, opportunities for uh, people with just a bachelor's. For example, I just posted in the chat this like example of a job description uh, for um, someone who has a bachelor's or a master's who wants to come in and do science at Lawrence Civil War. This is just one example. Um, and sorry, I will also post in the link just like a general um, uh, post, uh, web, the website of where uh, you can actually look for jobs at Lawrence Civil War. Um, so Lawrence Civil War has this almost a post baccalaureate program where people with bachelor's can come and work at the lab for two to three years or something like that. And then a lot of them go on to uh, transition elsewhere or they even stay at the lab. Um, that is an opportunity that I wish I had known about, you know, getting the experience of working in a national lab before going to grad school. Um, that sounds pretty awesome. There are also people at national labs who uh, get hired into staff positions with just with, with a master's degree and they don't need, you don't need a, a PhD. Um, and there are so many people in my group uh, that uh, uh, fall under that uh, distinction. Um, and sorry, I'm posting several links in the chat and I believe there, uh, there will be opportunities for uh, these links to be shared after um, this session as well. Um, I also uh, wanna say that ev basically everybody around me working in this group of nuclear forensics has an earth science background. It's surprising, but our um, ability to, um, as earth scientists, to observe the world, 
um, like be really good at analyzing strange materials that have, that comes in handy. Um, and so uh, as an example of a, a career path that you might have, um, working at a national lab uh, is a place where some of the skills that you've been learning as earth scientists can be used to be applied to some real, real world problems. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's been, it's been really eye opening to me that um, my expertise in looking at strange lake carbonates could be applicable to something else. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christine. And those links are amazing. Thank you for sharing those. Um, and as Christine said, we'll try to follow up with all of our participants today with, with some more information about that. Um, next, uh, Hazel, could you give us uh, your answer to question number one? Sure. Um, I think this is really interesting because, again, I agree with Arsenio and with Christine that like you don't necessarily know what's going to be out there. I would also add that my job and my like work, area of work didn't exist when I graduated my undergraduate degree. That's how old I am. But um, yes, it's it's like you never know what what kind of opportunities are going to arise later on in terms of how things are going to develop in your field. Um, I also would like to say at this point that I think that we're already um, working in very science or science adjacent fields, um, even though we're not in academia, but there's actually, if you want to leave academia, there's lots of opportunities if you want to leave science as well. If you want to not work in a science field, if you want to work in a different field that's got nothing to do with your actual science degree, there's no stigma connected to that. You haven't failed your degree if you decide to leave and work doing something else. That's also completely fine. Having said that, if you want to stay science adjacent in your, um, in your field, in science communication particularly, there's a lot of growth around the areas of community liaison work. So if you want to work um, in community advocacy or community liaison work with science communication, um, particularly with geoscience, you will be a very valuable person. Um, as in my experience as well, a lot of people moving into science communication work tend to come from environmental and biosciences. Um, and the geosciences tend to be a little bit underrepresented sometimes in those fields. And so if you're interested in, in that kind of um, work, like working directly with impacted communities around various different projects from um, resource extraction to um, energy um, development, to um, geotechnics, to um, climate advocacy, there's lots of opportunities there. I see there's a real demand in that area. So that would be my quick answer. Thank you so much, Hazel. Um, and next we will hear from Tibogo. I might, um, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, for me, yeah, for me, yeah, there's quite a lot of opportunities at the moment, you know, I, I know I'm self employed, but I'm always looking for geoscientists or, you know, uh, graduates who can assist me with my projects when I do feasibility studies and also I'm looking for somebody to help me with environmental impact assessment so I wouldn't mind having one of you know the students as consultants assisting me so that I can have you know proper documentation when I tender for projects and there are some exciting opportunities especially in South Africa whereby the mining industry is introducing hydrogen uh, production technology. So I believe there are opportunities that are available, including renewable energy, because we are currently doing coal mining. But yeah, we are looking for scientists who can assist us to come with sustainable solutions and also reduce, you know, carbon emissions and all that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's so cool. Um, and last but not least, uh, Rosie. Would you like to share with us? 
Yeah, I would echo a lot of what the panel have said already. I know at the Met Office, um, people can come in at any degree level. So we have people who come after an undergraduate, a master's or PhD and postdoc work and just come in at different levels and there's the ability to progress in between. I wish I'd known that this was an option earlier on as well. I don't know if I would have taken it, but it would have been nice to know about that. In terms of skill sets that we're looking at, I'll just talk specifically from a Met Office perspective. We're getting a lot more into computer learning at the moment and big data analytics, if that's what you're into. We also just had a new supercomputer commissioned and to make it run more efficiently, they're going to translate some of the old code into new coding language. So if you love talking in computer code language, you can sit and translate that. Um, that would be my worst nightmare. But um, on the side of stuff that I'm doing, there is also a lot of opportunities for scientists who can interpret a lot of information and synthesize it and explain it to other people which all of you on this call I'm sure can do because that is what you do as a research scientist you read a whole bunch of stuff and then you write a paragraph which you delete and rewrite 10 times until it's good so the skills that you have are are so needed in the world and as Hazel mentioned not just in science but um in lots of different sectors as well so you've just got to back yourself I think you got the skills definitely <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to uh, give any of our panelists one more opportunity to answer this question if they've thought of anything else and um, just briefly give that opportunity. If not, we'll move on to question. Yeah. Okay. Arsena. Thanks, yeah. Alana. So um, now that I've got time to think about this, <laughs> you know, my problem. So um, what I would add is you have a set but they talk about this a lot in industry, set up soft skills and hard skills and what computer program you know and all that. Those are all very good. And I'm glad that Rosie mentioned data science. That's something that's growing a lot. There's has different aspects, but also as a student, you develop skills of time management, even if it's just managing your time. If you're really organized, if you can do project management, um, you have those skills. So those are also skills that can be directly applicable to managing a project that is in a similar area um, that you work with or not, and then applying to that job and showcasing what your project management skills are. It's like a lot about knowing some of your soft skills and then translating them into the position that you want, the type of salary you want, the type of job, and the location of the job. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, I think we're going to move on to our second question now. Uh, try to keep on on our schedule here. We have so much to cover. Um, our second theme, um, and hopefully you can see the slides. Um, our second theme was networking that came out of the out of the questions from our registrant our registrants. Um, and so that question is, how do you search or network for job opportunities? And how can you navigate connections between academia and non-academia? Um, so I think this is really important for, for everyone who's currently seeking this kind of position. Um, and so we actually are going to change a little bit of our format here, and we're going to call on two of our five panelists to answer this question. Um, so let's start with Christine. Christine, can you, can you help us answer this question? Yes, uh, sounds good. Um, so I'm a person who has historically felt very uneasy and uncomfortable about this idea of networking, um, the idea of uh, talking to people just because you might want something from them, you know, a job has always felt a little transactional and weird and forced to me. Um, and so just saying, putting that out there for anybody who might feel similarly. Um, however, uh, in my experience so far, um, looking back, it has definitely been true for me, uh, for better or for worse, that mantra that it's not what you know, but who. Um, I think every position that I've had since undergrad has been because of people that I knew as friends or colleagues or mentors or folks that I've met through research collaborations or at conferences and meetings. And so I suppose my biggest advice here is to um, not be afraid of asking and going out of your comfort zone to, to seek opportunities to meet other people and to 
ask point blank if they're hiring or to, to say that you're interested in learning more about what they do and could could we have you know a conversation over zoom or i don't know when we'll next be in person but have coffee or whatnot um as a, personally as a recovering doormat who always felt that it was an imposition to ask such things of other people um i would say that uh, the worst that people can tell you is no, uh, you know, I don't have time or or whatnot, or no, I don't have funding at the moment. Um, but it really doesn't hurt to ask and to to learn more about these opportunities. Um, if you can go uh, to conferences or get involved in research projects that have many collaborators um, across different institutions and in other places, um, I would definitely seek those out. I remember that I applied to every grant that I could find on the internet so that I could fund myself to go to um, uh, said conferences. Um, and I was also very lucky in that I happened to be at institutions that also had funding to um, assist me as a student to, to go to these conferences. Um, and so, uh, and, and applying for those kinds of grants does get easier once you write the first one because you can, you know, reuse and um, I use that text for many other different kinds of applications. Um, but yeah, I guess I would say that, you know, ask a lot of questions. Don't feel like you're imposing on other folks just to ask about, like, are you hiring? Like, I'm interested in learning more about what you do. Tell me more. Um, at various conferences in our discipline, there are always vendors and uh, outside, you know, companies and other places, you know, have their booths um, at AGU, for instance, and maybe at GSA. Uh, and I would, yeah, I would encourage you to just talk to the people who are um, behind those booths and, you know, ask uh, lots of questions about what they do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and then I think we also want to call on Rosie to answer this one. Do you have any insights for us? Oh, yeah, I was just typing plus one to everything Christine said in the chat, actually. Um, yeah, I would say don't be afraid to reach out to people to ask for a coffee and a chat. Um, I often just ask if they had 20 minutes free for a conversation. And this advice actually came from my uncle who works in scaffolding. So not an uncle who I thought would be helpful when I was trying to find a job. And he said, I will not have the answer for you, but I know somebody and they might know somebody who knows somebody. And it's awkward and you just have to say, when I've had an awkward conversation with somebody, I get to eat a cake or something, whatever floats your boat to encourage you to get it done. So I tried to do one a week. I would do a cold email. Hi, I wanna just have a conversation with you. I'm looking for opportunities outside academia. These are my skills. So I started, he, and he let me know that my cousin was working with someone and my cousin works in like brand placement he was doing a trainer brand placement with the ocean conservancy but that's ocean and he was like ocean your ocean that's ocean have the conversation so i would say reach out have the conversation the other big thing for me is linkedin is huge outside of academia and it isn't big in academia and you have to get on it and it sucks and i'm sorry it's another thing that you have to do but it it is big and people do look at your linkedin and apparently they look if you've looked at their company or followed their company or something so just get on there, follow a bunch of companies that you think sound good. You can add me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm sure some of the other panelists are on LinkedIn. Get some friends on that. I was like, I feel awkward friending people on LinkedIn if I don't know them. But it's not like Facebook. People don't get awkward about that. And so I just cold messaged people on LinkedIn. And like Christine said, the worst thing to say is no, and you're where you were when you started. So uh, and if you do get to speak to someone, then you get a bit of cake. So, you know, that's the reward system that you've got to go with. So that would be that would be my suggestion. Have as many conversations as you can. And that helps you because people are like, oh, think outside the box. It's great. But when you're in that tunnel of like rejection from academic jobs and sadness, then it's really hard to think outside the box. So I think having those conversations really helps to make those first steps. Oh, it looks like tobogo has got her hand up. Yeah, go for it, Tabogo. Why don't you just chime in? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I think Rosie touched on something very important. I just wanted to yeah, make a comment on that. Uh, LinkedIn, it's very important. I remember in 2018, you know, I started posting a lot of things on LinkedIn and I started con 
connecting with a lot of people globally and I was invited to go and speak in Dubai at the Dubai Mining Show. And when I got there, I think I was one of the few women around a room full of men at a mining conference. So for me, it was a great exposure and yeah, networking with the right people. I remember, you know, I used to want to give up, you know, it's very difficult to tap into the mining procurement space, but one day I attended the mining industry, CEOs of the mine, and I approached the people and today I'm doing business in one of their mines. So it's very important to really network with a lot of people. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much for that addition. That's so important. And I'm really glad that you brought up those electronic tools as well. Thank you. Um, I think we should move on. If Does anybody else have anything to say about this question? If, I think we should move on to our third theme which was about transferable skills and qualifications. Um, there's quite a few little sub questions here. So I'm gonna read them out loud, but they'll also be in the chat. Um, so the questions are, what are transferable skills from academia? What are employers looking for in terms of qualifications? What extra training or experience is desired? And what level of degree is required to be successful in a career outside of academia? Um, and so we were hoping that Hazel would start us off with this conversation. <laughs> Thanks for the complicated question. Yes, um, it's no, it's, it's they're all really important questions. And I think it's difficult because they do have very different answers. Um, I think in terms of qualifications, just generally, that's really hard to answer because it really depends on the job that you want to do. Um, and so I would say what level of degree is required to be successful in a career outside of academia, that is up to you um, because it's the level of degree that you are able, capable or interested in doing to get the job that you want. There are lots of ways to get jobs that you want. Very few require certain degrees. Once you've got your, um, if you want to work in the science adjacent field, once you've got your undergraduate degree, that really sets you up well in a lot of fields. You don't necessarily need further degrees. In terms of other qualifications, with the science communication kind of mask on um, initially, what I would look for with science communication qualifications is that somebody has actually attempted some, that somebody has done some, that someone has attended courses, but they don't have to be expensive or in depth or very long, like full length courses. If you have the ability or the option to do science communication training, that is very detailed and advanced a master's or anything like that, that's fantastic, that's great, but it's not like essential. But I would want to see that you have engaged in some science communication training um, to help you develop your own skills if that's a field that you're interested in working in. Lots of universities offer short courses in science communication. A lot of them are, um, if not free, then free to students. Um, so you should be able to participate in those. Um, and I would say that's super important um, if you're looking to work in science communication, especially. I want to see the evidence that you have made extra effort to learn how to do science communication. Um, the other thing that I'll say about transferable skills is that my big transferable skill that I look for is one that everyone talks about, but it's actually quite complicated and essential to a good team is team building, team working. Um, having a functional ability to work with other people is something that takes a lot of uh, skill to develop because it's not just about knowing how to work with other people. It's knowing about how you function in a team where you best um, kind of thrive in a team environment, but also being able to identify other people's strengths as well and help them, support them, be adaptable in your work environment. And I know from experience like whenever you are in a course and someone brings up you know it's a team assessment it's a team assignment everyone groans because it can be quite challenging to do a team assessment when you're um, studying a, a university but having those skills at team working is so essential even if you're working by yourself as an individual even if you're a contractor or self-employed those team building, team working skills are so critical in being able to work with different stakeholders, different clients. It, it's such a key skill for me. I'm always looking for really strong team skills. So that would be my super short answer to this complicated question. 
Thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, Tiboko, would you like to um, help us answer this question as well? Do you have any insights for us? Yeah, for me, uh, in the industry that I am, like you need to pay attention to detail. I know as young people, we like to finish our projects very fast. So sometimes you end up making mistakes. So you really need to, you know, do proper research before you get into any project and make sure that you do it right the first time because it can be very costly you know to keep on making mistakes and all that so yeah and like hazel said teamwork teamwork is very important and being a motivational leader you always need to include you know the junior you know employees you know to share ideas so that they all feel like they are a part of a team so that you you are not the only owner of the business. So I always, you know, delegate responsibilities and make sure that, you know, people are able to think on their own when I'm not there in the office. So yeah, teamwork is very important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, I think we're going to move on to our fourth theme, our fourth question, which is about age and career transitions. Uh, I personally am very interested in this. Um, so how does age factor into career transitions? Can you transition into a career outside of academia as a mid-career scientist in your 40s and 50s? And again, this question will be in the chat. Um, can we hear from Rosie first? Would you help us with this one? Yeah, so I mean, I transitioned after a, a postdoc, which I don't think is an unusual time to transition, but having been at the Met Office, they have hired, I think, 150 people uh, since um, lockdown. So there's been lots of people coming in and, and people have transitioned mid-career. Um, there are opportunities for people who have been professors to kind of come in at a higher level to kind of guide the strategic thinking of where the Met Office is going next. Um, but there's also people who are coming in who have worked kind of in consultancy or there's one guy who has worked in accounting. But he's like, I just love data and I love numbers. So I can do climate numbers. I can do accounting numbers. So, I mean, there's definitely the opportunity to do that. And, and I haven't noticed that there's that uh, any negative connotations with that. The only flip side to that I would say is when I was looking, I kind of thought I might try and get into policy, doing some policy stuff, because I feel like when you're in academia and you're like, oh, I don't I don't know if I want to be in academia, people are like, just do policy. It turns out people do actual degrees in science policy and they get experience as part of those degrees. So you could find that you don't have that experience. And so people say you may need to go in at a more entry level for that and work your way up. I don't know if that's the same everywhere, but that's definitely the experience that I got applying for stuff in the UK. So I would say there are opportunities, but do be aware that sometimes the advice you might get from your professors who have been in academia for 30 or 40 years is not relevant to the situation in the workplace today. So uh, talk to other people who are in those jobs. Great, thank you so much. Um, next, uh, Arsina, can you fill in some insights for us? I'll be happy to. So I'll answer the second part of the question first. Yes, it's possible. I was 42 <laughs> and I'm still alive. So um, it is possible. Um, it is more difficult though. So um, if you have spent your um, time in academia, you have a set of skills that you can transfer to industry, but um, going mid-career with an academic background, um, you have to work on showing that you can transfer those skills. So you start from a place of disadvantage and companies can be very good at setting things up, helping their experienced hires uh, move forward in the company, all that. There's a lot of um, information and tools provided. But what I'm seeing in my workplace is if people are coming in as interns, or if people are coming in right up out of graduate school um, with a bachelor, or master's, or PhD, depending on the job, um, there is a more clear pathway and less bumps on the road for them. 
Having said that, two things. I like bumps on the road because they give you opportunities to grow. Um, but also bumps on the road sometimes make you veer off onto different roads that you weren't expecting. So as you're making changes, you're thinking outside of the box, thinking differently and doing things that grow your career. This is, this is how I feel. And this is you know, my experience, but I would again say it is absolutely possible. It is not easy. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're gonna move on to our fifth question, which the theme was personal reflections. Um, and so we were curious, what were the best parts and most challenging parts of transitioning to a career outside of academia? Is there anything you wished you knew in advance? And we're hoping that, uh, actually Arsina, that you would answer this first for us. <laughs> and then after you will call on Hazel. Thank you. Of course. So um, the best parts are, um, depending on the company that you work in, um, and, and this is going to be the next question, so I'll just touch on it. There can be a better work-life balance in industry. Um, sometimes in academia, people expect you to answer the one, their 1 a.m. email at 1 a.m. This is not the norm in academia unless something um, urgent is going on. Um, so, so there's that. Um, there's also um, pre-COVID, the clear distinction of when you come home, unless some big project is going on, you don't have to work. You don't, there's a very nice line between your work and life. Um, that, that has blurred a little bit working from home. Um, and then, so challenging parts, um, when I first joined my current job, my expectation was to bring in my hard skills like sensor uh, evaluation and move forward. But things happened and the company shifted and they put me in a similar thing, but it's not my area of expertise. So something that I was 100% sure of now has become, I have 10% knowledge. So you have to learn on the job which is fun, learning is good, but it also you're a step behind people who have been in that position for many years. So you have to learn continuously and add to your knowledge. And then sometimes just say, I don't know, and then move forward with that. Um, and then things that I wish I knew in advance. Um, that's a good question. I'd say, um, in, in academia on the side of studying, um, having um, tangible proof of your soft skills. And by that, I mean, if, if there is a project management seminar that you can take, that you can add to it. I think Rosie was the one who mentioned volunteer oppor opportunities that she had gone to and then use those to showcase some of her skills. So like thinking about what you're doing and what skill that showcases and putting that in your resume and seeking those specific opportunities. Do you miss academia? I definitely miss that people that I worked with very, very much. Also, I live in Houston now and I used to live in Fort Collins. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Hazel, do you wanna give us just a quick, um, quick input on that? Sure, um, I think the, the the, the kind of best parts and most challenging parts I also think that it's for me one of the best parts of working outside of academia is job security um, that I am no longer at the mercy of a short-term contract or um, and sometimes those short-term contracts are exceedingly short uh, and now I know that if I leave my current job the chances are it's because I've chosen to and not been forced out by a deadline um, which makes a real big difference to my um, state of mind. Um, the most challenging parts, which is also kind of combined with something that I miss about academia, is when you're working in academia, you really get to follow the wind and um, just chase your own interests. Often when you're research field, you're able to really follow the data where it goes. When you are no longer working in academia, you are following the company or the organization that you work for. You're following their directions. 
um, this can sometimes feel restrictive. Um, personally, I quite like boundaries. Boundaries are a big deal for me. Um, and I find that, that it's a lot easier to put those in place in a, in a non-academic environment and that they're respected more in a non-academic environment. Um, but it does sometimes, I do sometimes miss the freedom of just um, chasing my own curiosity. Um, is there anything I wish I knew in advance? Um, I think that Arsenia's advice about um, preparing uh, evidence about what you want to follow is definitely really, really good advice. Um, I think also the fact that um, you, this decision that you make if you decide to leave academia, it's not your final decision. You can change your mind, you can come back. That, that no career step that you take is the end of your career. Like you can always change direction. So I think that's um, knowing that, uh, like it's given me more confidence moving in and out of academia throughout my career. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I think we're kind of running a little short on time here, but I really wanna hear, um, Tobogo, I'm giving you a heads up here. I wanna, I wanna ask you our question six. Um, and so uh, our question six here is about work-life balance, uh, especially since you're a mom of four, oh my goodness. Um, we are curious, how is the workplace culture uh, for you and your work life, uh, how is the work life balance different in your current job co uh, compared to maybe when you were in academia or, or in another job? Yeah, I think the reason I resigned from a permanent job was because of my kids. I wanted to spend more time with them, have a flexible, you know, time that I could spend with my family because my job was very demanding. But I wish I knew that being in mining, it means long hours. Now, I don't really spend a lot of time with my kids, but whenever I do find space, you know, we go on holiday and, you know, we try to make up for the lost time. And uh, what I can say is, in terms of work-life balance, especially for the young women, uh, don't rush into relationships, <laughs> you know, you must enjoy being single because now being a mother and then you have a husband and you need to look after your husband and cook and all those domestic things. I was struggling with that. Uh, that is why, you know, personally, I chose uh, to get out of my marriage. You know, I know it's, it was a difficult decision that I made, but I, I got married at a very young age. But I started to find myself around 30 years of age and I decided, you know what, God, I need to do something that I love and I don't need to look for permission from someone. So, yeah, sometimes life is so unfair. And now I just turned 40 on Saturday, on the 30th of October, and I feel like I, I really need to now, you know, take things slow. I also need a husband to look after me. <laughs> Now, I think now is the right time. Now is the right time to, to find that person and then allow my kids to also explore, you know, and do other things. But yeah, work-life balance is very challenging. All you need to do is find people who can assist you. Like, for example, I do have a good personal assistant who assists me with all the admin things. And at home, I have a good helper who assists me with kids. My kids sometimes say, you know what, mom, you are not there uh, when we do our school activities. I said, but you know, at least I paid for the trip. I paid for this, but they want me there. But they understand that sometimes I can't be there. And imagine I have four kids and I can't attend all the activities. They go to different schools. So I find it very difficult at the moment, but I'm trying, I'm trying my best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so that concludes our general Q&A session. And I want to just thank our panelists again. Thank you so much.